though I've already told you what the axioms are that define the object of a sheaf, I claim that I've not yet defined a sheaf for you properly. In general, whenever someone describes some object for you mathematically, which has a notion of maps between them, but they have not told you what those maps are, then you should complain that they have not finished defining the object for you. This is because, in some sense, the maps tell you what it is you ultimately care about with that object, right? So, uh, for example, vector spaces. You, after defining a vector space, you then define linear transformations, right? And that really gives you an idea of what's the core thing you want to preserve. It's the linearity, right? Because there's all these things going on, um, but it's it's really the scalar operation and the addition that you want to preserve. Same thing, for example, with a graph. You know, the, you look at the definition of a graph in terms of oh, these pairs of sets and what is it that really matters here? Well, when you define the notion of a graph homomorphism, it really drives home the fact that the essential thing about a graph is the adjacency relation. So let's see if we can come up with what the definition should be of sheaves. Um, well, let's think. So uh, I guess I'm slowly, since we've already started with R specifically, and I've dropped a, a bunch of hints everywhere that really me writing R was immaterial, right? Because all the words that came out of my mouth were about open sets, and that applies just as well to an arbitrary topological space. So I'm going to start writing X for an arbitrary uh, topological space. Uh, of course, you are welcome to still think about uh, the real numbers whenever I write x. So let's suppose that we have two pre-sheaves for now. Let's not worry about sheaves at the moment. Let's suppose that we have two pre-sheaves. Um, sometimes we write this notation uh, with them ab above the symbol. So let's suppose we have two pre-sheaves, f and g. Okay, so what should be a morphism between them? How should we define what it means to map from one sheaf uh, to the other? Well, I mean, the, the sheaf itself is kind of it's this whole compendium of datum attached to each open set, right? So, well, why don't we look at the open sets, right? Maybe we can define what a morphism of sheaf should be um, by sort of defining it for each piece of that data, right? So I'm going to say that for any open set, okay, how should I how should I compare these two sheaves? Well, I can compare their open sets, uh, uh, the the uh, sections over that open set, right? So I look at the sheaf over U, I look at the sheaf uh, over G. And now, so what I'm going to do is, is you know, a morphism, let's call this little f, is going to be a collection of morphisms over each of these open sets. And now remember that we said, uh, you know, originally we were just going to think about, you know, our sheaf always being so f at u, well, we were always just going to think about it um, as a set. But of course, we could think about it, you know, as we realize the ring of continuous functions is, well, I just said it, it's a ring, right? It's also an abelian group. We normally think about our sheaves um, as being concentrated in these smaller collections instead of just all sets, right? But whatever your focus is, uh, she is sheaves of uh, abelian groups or sets or vector spaces, modules even, what have you, what we want to do then is make sure that over U, our morphism lines up with that notion, right? So um, if I've chosen this in such a way that F of U is always an abelian group, um, and, and same with G of U is always an abelian group, then a morphism is, of course, uh, over U, it's going to be a morphism of abelian groups, right? So I want to make sure I'm, I'm sort of uh, preserving that target structure that we're looking at. Um, and then what else should there be, right? Because we want our morphism to capture the essential feature of a pre-sheaf or sheaves more, um, I suppose less generally, I should say sheaves. 
uh, well, what was it that we really had, right? So we had all these, uh, so for the sheaf itself, we had all these gluing conditions and whatever. Um, but when it came just to the pre-sheaf, the basic thing that we had um, for this pre-sheaf was the restriction map and a consistency condition on that restriction map, right? So what we should um, hope then is that uh, let's consider now an open set V contained in U. And in that case, then I'm going to have a restriction map down to uh, the uh, to V in both cases. And between the, you know, the, the sections of these sheaves on these lower spaces, I'm also by assumption I have uh, right, my morphism um, is part of is really the datum of a whole bunch of morphisms, right, over each of the open sets. And well, what what should be the case? So, side note, I didn't say this before, but of course, um, you know, we would want our again, if if we happen to be working in in abelian groups or rings or something, uh, we would want our restriction maps to be morphisms preserving those structures as well. So what should be the case? I mean, those of you who are already a bit categorically minded probably already see what the right thing to do here is, right? We want these maps to not just preserve whatever structure there may be of the sections of the sheaves themselves, but the actual restriction property. And therefore we're going to demand that this diagram be commutative, right? That is to say that if I start with some section, um, some section S in F, and I first uh, restrict that section, so I, I apply my, uh, or rather, um, I apply my, my morphism over the open set U. So now this lands in uh, the sections of G over U, and then I apply the restriction map, um, and perhaps I'll, I'll put the G up top to say that this is G's restriction map uh, down to V. Then that ought to be the same thing as first applying the restriction map coming from uh, my sheaf, or pre-sheaf, I should say, um, F. Um, and then, of course, applying the uh, morphism I have over the open set V. Right. So this sort of binds together all the consistency conditions that we care about. Right. Um, we want these maps to be morphisms uh, in whatever target we're having these sheaves land in. And it needs to respect the restriction property. Right. That was really the essential thing about the pre sheaves and even sheaves is it's this restriction map. And we had our questions about what happens when we restrict. And what can we say if we have some smaller piece, what can we say about, you know, what restrictions it came from? That is the definition of a morphism of free sheaves. And now we're simply going to define uh, a morphism of sheaves. Well, remember, sheaves are just pre-sheaves plus some extra conditions. So we're simply going to define a morphism of sheaves to be a morphism of pre-sheaves. The fancy thing that we're going to go to is, is uh, you know, in a few videos, we'll move to the categorical descriptions of these things, at least the first level of that. Um, this is an example of, of sheaves being a full subcategory of pre-sheaves. Okay, so that does it for this video, short and sweet, and I'll see you next time.